Hey everybody, welcome to the Resistance Broadcast. I'm John. Thank you so much for joining us on this Monday, March 11th, the Ides of March, Daylight Savings in full effect. It is sunny out later, but a dark shadow always cast. From the shadows comes the Emperor Palpatine. We're actually going to talk about <laughs> the history that went into the casting of Palpatine for Return of the Jedi specifically. We, you know, we know that there was a different situation with Clive Ravel and other things in Empire for that brief cameo since uh, has been replaced by Ian McDiarmid. But it's an interesting story of how he got cast and it was possibly one of the most perfect castings due to the fact of the prequels that came thereafter. But James... How you doing? You got the Rise of Skywalker on a big Palpatine oh, yeah. movie, a big Ian McDiarmid movie, but we're going to dial it back about 36 years before that. And talk. What if they bought back Clive for Rise of Skywalker? Is he still around, you think? No, oh, I don't know. But wouldn't that be funny if they were like, it makes the most sense. He was the original emperor. <laughs> like, right. That, that was the emperor's true form. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, yeah, E. McDermott's version was just one of his bodies, like Snoke. Everybody's uh, like big question marks, and he's like, "They didn't call me. I don't know." Honestly, <laughs> I don't know. If, if Lucas did that, it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me. He did some pretty <laughs> wild stuff. Um, but yeah, we're going to talk about that uh, very fateful uh, and serendipitous casting that wound up paying big time. Uh, later in the show, but we have other stuff to talk about. First, James, did you catch the uh, the Critics' Choice Awards? Uh, Ahsoka cashing in some nominations. Did you happen to ca- catch uh, what was nominated for Ahsoka? Yeah, you know, best superhero series, best actress in a superhero series, uh, best science fiction fantasy series, limited series, right. or made for TV movie. Yeah, it's kind of uh, opened up there a little bit. Uh, best actress in science fiction. And best villain in a series. Uh, mm-hmm. Um, so I had tweeted about the fact that, you know, I'm happy for Lars Mickelson, but just shocked that he got nominated and not Ray Stevenson, who because R- Lars Mickelson, in my opinion, wasn't even the best villain in his own show, uh, let alone competing with other villains from other shows. Uh mm-hmm. Ray Stevenson, in my opinion, stole the show of Ahsoka. I thought Thrawn was good, but Nothing super memorable in the way that Balin Skull was for me. How about you? No, I mean, I think like just reading that alone, you're like, oh, yeah, that makes sense for Lars Mikkelsen. What? Oh, wait, what? You know, it's kind of a like that's kind of surprising because you see best villain in a series. <laughs> like, I get it, but Thrawn's going to be nominated best villain in the series later, you know, or or yeah. whatever it is later. He'll or in the movie. Through- yeah. Yeah, exactly. He'll be able to stand out in those things. This was like, I don't know. It's almost like saying best villain of Avengers goes to Thanos. Right. And it's like, oh, he wasn't like Loki was the villain in that movie, you know? And it's like, I get it. Like, but this is, this is set up for Thrawn. It's not, um, it's not, I don't really think it was, it was his thing, but but this one. I don't know. It's interesting. You know, it's funny too. Some of these, like, I, you know, you got to point it out <laughs> like best science fiction slash fantasy series slash limited series slash made for TV movie. It's almost like <laughs> on a Thursday, <laughs> you know, between the hours of seven and eight on Very network niche. television. Yeah, <laughs> it's like all these things seem some a little bit like this. And often too, like, not to take it down at all because you know ahsoka is a show that is pushing the boundaries with like the technology and it was very captivating even for people that weren't like super into star wars and all that stuff so i'm not bringing it down but with a lot of these shows with a lot of star wars things i feel like it's constantly like oh you know this was nominated for 17 saturn awards you know and i'm like Oh yeah. Okay. You know, it was a good show, you know? Yeah. But it feels like there's so many different award shows and award things out there. Critics choice, not 
unknown. It's but a, you know yeah. what I mean. But like but, I, I want I like Emmys. I think is like the main thing. Well, or Emmys for Golden Globes does TV right. Emmys and Emmys and Golden Globes. Um, you know, Golden Globes is Hollywood, Hollywood Foreign Press. Right. That one's a little like it's known, but it's not as prestigious. It, it it has lost a lot of its luster in recent years due to the politics of Hollywood and like their thoughts on the uh, uh, Hollywood foreign press and stuff like that. And I don't think people hold it in as high regard as maybe they used to because it used to be like, well, the Golden Globes is sort of foreshadowing who's going to win the Oscars or whatever. And now I don't yeah, think people look at the Golden Globes the same way anymore. I don't think people look at award shows the same way anymore. I think people are getting a little over the um, just the facade and the stuffiness and all that that comes together with these shows a lot of times. But John, anyway, John Williams even talked about it in his interview. He he touched on the discuss that the award ceremonies. Yeah, he talked about how eh, it's you know it's a little bit like what you were describing, John. Like it's not as fun. And he said it was like it used to be back in the day that it wasn't televised. So the whole theme of the Oscars was like the show was going to be, if you're primarily known for your uh, dramatic work, then they were going to pull you on stage to do a comedy routine. The mm-hmm. point was that you were always pulled on stage to do something sort of opposite what you're known for. Um, and that was the fun of it. And everybody was having a good time. And and then he says, once it got televised, like everybody got too serious about it and it became like a, like a, a, he didn't say this, but like, you know what it was, but like, well, it was like a ratings thing and everybody took it too seriously and it was a showcase and, for talent. And the patter writer, and, the writing is, is very, a little bit cheesy and the knock him up, set him down and the pretending right. it's all uh, spontaneous when it's obviously not type of stuff. But anyway, good luck to Ahsoka for Critics' Choice. Uh, I do think. Ray Stevenson got a little snub there. But anyway, uh, he's number one in our hearts anyway. Um, James, we are kicking things off with one with the force this this Monday. On this Monday. On this Monday. All right. One with the force. Here we go. The force is with me. And I'm one with the force. All right, John. Like you said, one with the force. Uh, it's been a little bit, but we are back at it. Uh, this time we're going to kick it off with this interesting weird ahsoka slightly related question (laughs) you stumble into the world between worlds and time means nothing there you have the chance to watch the trailer for any of the upcoming star wars movies which trailer are you choosing john Hmm. only pick one that's how it works that is very tough with the force I have two that I'm narrowing it down to, but I think uh, I think I'm going to say the Ray movie um, because I think I know what I'm going to get from a Mando trailer at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, the idea of seeing anything post episode nine with that blank canvas is very intriguing to me, but then also the mangled situation i would like to get a trailer of that but i feel like man a mangled trailer isn't going to reveal a lot so i'm gonna go with the ray movie because i'm just very intrigued to see what that blank open future has in store for us and also see you know get the feeling of the nostalgia and like i I feel like trailers are good with for that to push that button um, so I'm going with the Ray movie. What about you? So it depends on how much you're going to let me cheat here. All right. Because oh. my 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 one that I would choose to watch is the, the Ryan Johnson, Ryan Johnson one. one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't think you were going to say that. I didn't mean to steal your, th- your thunder. I never no, thought in a million I mean- years you would say that. Well, see, here's the thing is that I actually think, and and maybe this is just the situation... Maybe this is just how things are always. But the things that are the furthest away from what I believe is reality are the things that I think are the most different and unique. Everything that is very real and tangible right now, Ray movie. Okay. Mandalorian Grogu, you mentioned that. Yeah, okay. You know, maybe maybe Lando. Like, I, 
I've already seen Lando. I know I know what a Lando movie is going to look like. I, I already kind of have this idea. But the ones that are real, that are more interesting to me are sort of like the Taika Waititi, the Sean Levy, the Ryan Johnson. So whichever one of those were, I mean, Taika Waititi is actually officially announced, says it's still happening. Ryan Johnson also officially announced, but so long gone, probably let it go. Sean Levy not officially announced. So I guess what I have to land on is Taika Waititi in that case. But I think like everything that's close by is like it's it feels like a spinoff. Everything that's in the future right now is a spinoff. Oh, except for the Mangold thing. That's a good one, too. Yeah. But, I, but I'm I'm going even wilder because I don't even know what Taika's is. So Ryan Jones. How's that? Yeah, I guess you can pick that. And then what if you pick that? And then so I can like, pick Ryan Johnson. I'll go Ryan Johnson then. So if you pick Ryan Johnson and then you go into like whatever the door is to, to view it and it's just like error. Or it shows you like it messes up and shows you the trailer for like The Last Jedi or something. And this is not the podcast to do it, but I love talking about that deeper stuff of like if I then pick Ryan Johnson's and it somehow does get into fruition, do do I then make it happen? Like, is that me choosing it? Does that mean that it now is destined to happen? We'll never know. We'll never know. But we will know when it's time to move on to the question, the next question. And that time is now, what is the best puppet ever created for star Wars? Now there are a ton and there are, Good choices, bad choices. I'm kind of torn between two and for the same purpose. Um, there's an obvious one, so I'll go with the um, uh, the other non-obvious one, and I can't think of the character's name right now. Oh, boy. Uh, Mandalorian. Gar, gar, gra, Gro- the, the squid guy. Not squid guy, plant guy, the pirate. Was that a puppet? Yeah. I thought, it was, I thought it was a dude in a suit. I'd oh, that's puppet puppetry to me still. Hmm. I feel like I'm blanking on his name. Yeah. Oh, uh, what was his name? Uh Gorian Shard or something like that. Gorian Shard. That's it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That's it. That, that's I, the greatest puppet ever created for Star Wars. I, yeah. Well, I mean, look, I know, I know other arguments, but I think the thing is, is I would say in recent years, because when it look, when you look back at the old stuff, those things are slightly less magical to me because I do know how they work, you know, I'm, 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 I don't know. I just something about like, it's been a while since a puppet has entered into star Wars. And I'm like, Whoa, like blown away by how they're pulling that off and how it's somehow able to break that barrier of like, I believe that that, that thing is also, um, interacting with a real human. Like I believe that that Muppet is also really there tangibly there. Okay. All right. I mean, that's, that's an interesting pick. I, yeah, I I don't know if he's considered a puppet or not. I don't know. Uh, but I, he looked cool. Um, so, uh, but mine might be one of the ones you were thinking of and maybe it is obvious, but I have to give it to this one and it's job of the hut. That was the that was the one. Yeah, yeah I mean, just the two ev- that I was between everything about that. You know, the five people to make it, you know, function, the eyes, the tongue, the mouth, the slime, the tail, everything that went with it. Uh, clearly one of the most difficult things to put together and pull off, especially during that time. And it still holds up to this day, because if they ever did make Solo 2 happen or go to Jabba's palace, I would want them to bring Jabba back into the fold as a puppet. Uh, I think it looks better than all the CGI ones. So job is my pick. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I understand where you're coming from. Like a puppet is sort of a, a loose thing or whatever, but, but like, I don't know if this guy's talking 
but they have obviously some type of animatronic thing on his face as well. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, so the puppet is being controlled by his facial movements. I mean, I guess that's, I don't know. I just, I just loved him. I, I, I thought like, what am I looking at? It's not. Human. Oh, it's definitely fun. It doesn't, yeah. It doesn't feel but. like a guy in a suit necessarily felt like they were like, I don't know. Like it felt like a puppet. To so me. if we so, did best puppet draft, he'd be your number one pick. <laughs> Possibly. Yeah. Again, like it's it's tough, man, because I, I I've I know the stories. I'm sorry, I feel like I'm defending this like crazy. I know the stories of like if the if the puppet doesn't work, Star Wars doesn't work, you know, and like Yoda is like it has to work. Yeah. But I do think that there's something about like those things are they've just always been Star Wars to me for so long that of course it I have to sort of like I'm I'm wanting for something to like blow me away and impress me. And when I saw this guy walk onto the scene, I was like, what am I looking at? It's so cool, so believable and did not feel like a human didn't feel CG. You know, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I loved it. Um. But we can move on to the next one here. And this one's going to be the last one for Will of the Force this week. But the question one is. One with. Oh, did I say Will of the Force? <laughs> one with the Force. So used to it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you can watch your favorite Star Wars movie with anyone who has been in a Star Wars movie. What is the movie and who are you choosing? John, this is you. Empire Strikes Back. And. I didn't put living or dead. Do you want to do living or does it not matter to you? It doesn't matter to me. I, although I did consider that and I just sort of assumed living, but if you've got an answer that's dead, I don't really. So know. if I did living, I think I would pick Lawrence Kasdan. Oh, He Lawrence Kasdan was in a Star Wars movie. Well, am I allowed to like he wrote it? Am I allowed to pick him? No, I thought it was cast members. All right, then I'm picking because I'd probably George, George, choose George because my George, George, George was in a Star Wars movie. Yes, right, that is true. I because my pick was going to be Carrie Fisher, but if we can't pick yeah. dead people, that's why I went with Kasdan. Um. I guess I would pick probably George Lucas using that caveat that he's been in a Star Wars movie. Dang. Um, I mean, Car Carrie would be my pick if I could pick someone who's passed away because I think that would just be like really fun to watch a movie with Carrie Fisher. How about um, you? So it's funny that we just did the the puppet thing because I, I, had, I was a fan of Diego Luna before Rogue One even. I was like, I was happy that he was cast in the movie and I loved his movie and everything. So I, I would like to meet him just in general. So I thought it would be fun, but I was like, man, I've really heard him talk Ignatium about Andor and Rogue One and I know the stories and everything. But then I remembered that he is a huge Jabba the Hutt fan. And I thought, I'd love to watch Return of the Jedi with Diego Luna and just have him, you know... Really explain everything about what Star Wars means to him. Like this movie, you know, like I saw this and it changed everything. This is why I wanted to be, this is why I wanted to be in film. And like, he just, he's been on record so much about saying how big of a job of the Hutt fan and how that would be the person he'd want to meet. So if I was going to watch Star Wars with Diego Luna, I'd want to watch Return of the Jedi. All right. You yes, yeah, so unexpected George choices. <laughs> yeah. I want to know, yeah. What do you want to watch? Uh, Rise Rise of Skywalker with George Lucas. And what? Yeah, and what movie did you say you'd watch? Rogue One. Return of the Jedi. Return of the Jedi with Diego Luna. Yeah. Did you hear right. my explanation? I did, but I got distracted by uh, the news that I guess we have to talk about here. Um, which I don't know if you saw, but you probably saw, is that the I creator did. of Dragon Ball passed away. Akira Toriyama? Yes. Oh my gosh. Uh, Lacey really? Just posted it. Yeah, she posted it in our chat. Um, by the way, yeah, Lacey's uh, going to be back with us on Thursday. She was not feeling well. 
Um, but she'll be back. Uh, but yeah, Akira Toriyama, creator of Dragon Ball, has passed away at the age of 68. That is wild. You know how awful Microsoft Bing is? It's not pulling up anything about this in news or just their general search. Mm. Um, but yeah, rest in peace. I uh, know, James, I don't know if you <laughs> want to oh, say man. anything about it, this. Uh, it's not Star Wars, of course, but I know, you know, Dragon Ball is a big thing for you. So, yeah, Thanks. he, you know, like I hate to say it's like, I mean, it is. It's so, so obvious is why I hate to say it, but Akira Toriyama is the George Lucas of Dragon Ball. And that series has had so many iterations of different shows and stuff that it's almost like there's his canon and then there's like anything else that anybody else did, which is maybe technically canon or whatever, but people are just like, I just don't, I don't honor it unless Akira Toriyama did something with it or was involved in it character designs or, or creation, you know, but, um, man, that is, that is wild because he's young and, I, and that, that wasn't, that wouldn't even be on my radar. I'm curious, um, you know, about wh- how that all happened, man, that's nuts. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if this deal. is accurate. I'm, I'm reading acute subdural hematoma. So I don't know, you know, what happened or, or whatever, but rest in peace. Yeah. Kira Toriyama creator of Dragon Ball Z, obviously uh, just a phenomenon. Um, So sorry, James. Sorry to have to have talked about that here. But um, you'll always have that stuff to to like, it'll always be there. So he like, just like we were saying about uh, to a lesser extent, Mark Dodson. But um, yeah. Goodness. Yeah. Where are we at? We are at. I said. Yeah, just to recap, I said uh, Diego Luna watching Return of the Jedi because he was so fascinated and enamored with Jabba the Hutt. And I feel like oh, watching, yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like him watching the original trilogy, specifically the last one where he loved the character and wanted to be, you know, wanted to interview him and all this other stuff. Like, I think he would really get into the spirit of like, yes, this is why I wanted to do Star Wars. This is why I wanted to do films. Like, you know, and I'd like to see him talk more about star wars and not just his projects no yeah, right on all right let's uh why don't we hop into the discussion for today all right let's go obi one once thought as you do all right here we go the fateful casting of ian mcdarmid as the emperor in return of the jedi so we're really just going to take a look back you know we've had uh, the late J.W. Rinsler on the show, we mostly spent the, our first time with him talking about A New Hope and Star Wars in general. And the second time it was for Empire Strikes Back's 40th anniversary. And unfortunately, we didn't have a chance to have him back on to talk about Return of the Jedi, but well documented in his making of Return of the Jedi book, among other areas, is how Ian McDiarmid wound up being cast to play the Emperor in 1983's Return of the Jedi. Um, a lot of things had to happen to have this fateful choice come to fruition. Um, so James, let's, let's take it back first. You know, I'm sure people who are listening to this, I'm sure most of them know the details about the emperor and, and all that, but you know, in, in, in his debut, because in a new hope, he's just mentioned in the empire strikes back, he makes his debut talking to Darth Vader and it's voiced by Clive Ravel at the time uh, in the initial run. Uh, and then the, the physical manifestation of Palpatine was a, a combination of a woman's face and monkey eyes. Uh, <laughs> just, just absolutely crazy. I don't know, what were they thinking? <laughs> just bananas. Absolutely crazy to think about, but that's what Meanwhile, they Meanwhile, Dune's over here like Christopher Walken will do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I still have to see, you know, Dune 2. But oh, um, it's phenomenal, man. It's phenomenal. Yeah, I gotta check it out. Um, but so obviously since then, uh in all current iterations, the Emperor has been replaced and the Emperor strikes back with Ian McDiarmid. Um but Even for Return Rebels. of the Jedi, you know, nineteen eighty two, they had another actor lined up to play Palpatine, or not he wasn't even Palpatine, he was just called the Emperor. 
at the time. And it was Alan Webb, who was like 76 years old uh, and not in great health. And because he wasn't in great health, he actually couldn't take on the role. And he wound up dying in June of 1982, which was a month after filming ended for Return of the Jedi. But it would have been a one and done for that actor. And they would have had to recast someone in the future when they brought the prequels. So he falls ill. He can't take the role. George Lucas sends out Mary Selway to find somebody. And she stumbles upon this play. And I have the quote from McDermott. I'd love to read it if you will oblige. Um, He says, the great Mary Selway, who was the casting director for Return of the Jedi, had seen, this is E. McDermott, had seen me in a play playing the aging, aged Howard Hughes. Well, a creation of Howard Hughes. He was called Henry Hackamore in the great Sam Shepard's play Seduced. And it was in a studio theater much smaller than this. I assume he was in a small theater. And so she said to George, this guy, he's relatively young, only 37, but he's probably going to be convincing as this older person, you know, 120 years old. So they cast him 37 years old. They obviously put the old makeup on him and Lucas wanted him to do a more similar sounding voice to what we heard in the original version of Empire Strikes Back. Clean tone, deep, slow, uh, you know, that type of dry voice. And McDermott pushed back and said, based on the look and stuff, he felt this more sinister, deep, throaty type of old man voice was better. And he did it for Lucas and Lucas loved it. And it's like, that that seems to be the theme with George Lucas. Like if you remember Light and Magic with Phil Tippett, he's like, I Mm -hmm. found if I actually made a physical uh, model of these things, it was harder for him to say no. It's just, it's almost like George felt bad to say no to people. So it's like Mace Window, can I have a purple lightsaber? He's like, uh, okay. <laughs> it's just like he didn't really he didn't really stand up to to his actors, um, which is fine. But so then they cast him. He's thirty seven years old, which was perfect. And this is why it's this fateful casting because in ninety seven, fifteen years after filming Return of the Jedi, they begin filming The Phantom Menace. He's 52. Palpatine's supposed to be exactly wow. that age. And they have they are able to bring the same actor back, which almost makes the prequels so good for just that reason. You know, mm-hmm. people who hate the prequels can't say a bad thing about that perfect situation. And, you know, McDermott being able to play a young, a young, you know, a 50s Senator Palpatine. And it just makes it all feel that much more real. You know what I mean? Absolutely. I think like it's, you know, I hate to say because like we're in that weird world where like, oh, man, it's a good thing. This day he didn't get canceled or you know what I mean? Like that, too. Like there's always the chance that when that much time goes by, something could come up with these actors. And we've been fairly lucky when it comes to um like, you know, Mark Hamill and Harrison Ford, and everybody being able to like reprise roles and things. Um but this was one of those weird situations where like like you said man it's wild the the chance that they would be looking to cast an old for an a character that is old so they cast young for some reason and then age them up and then you end up the next story is exactly perfectly the time frame for that old person to be the age that they actually are in real life. It's like, I don't know that very many things have ever done that, that it's, it's probably a bold thing. And maybe I'm just forgetting obvious things, but has that ever happened in any other franchise? In a like serendipitous way, because the only thing I could think of is, there's some movie, I don't even know the name of it, with like Ethan Hawke, where they've made sequels like decades later, and they they, but it, and I I don't I mean we've seen that happen with any movie like Harrison Ford returning as Han Solo and stuff, but there was something right. specific about that movie and its story that they came back and made it with all the same people or something. I don't know the specifics, but if yeah. Are you thinking of Boyhood? Is that it? 
So in Boyhood, they filmed the movie over the course of like 20 years. That's it. That yeah, might yeah. be it. Yeah. Yeah. But, but even then, like I said, that that's still not a situation where you have somebody right. who was young cast as an old character. Right. And then f- for some reason, the next story takes place earlier in the timeline and the person just is the age that they I, are. Yeah. I. It probably has never been done. It's just, <laughs> I know it's, it's such a wild situation and it, it wasn't planned. That's the, that's the other crazy thing about it. It's like he comes back and, and if I remember correctly too, when he was bringing him in, he, um, George Lucas informed Ian that he actually wanted him to play two characters. And it was like, it was not clear that that was the same character. And he was reading the script and everything, and he's like, "Oh, this, you know, I, it's cool that I get to play these two different characters for you, Phantom you, Menace." Yeah. Oh, so, so Sidious and Senator right. Palpatine. Is yeah. he actually was hiring him to play a younger Palpatine? Yeah, I can't remember what the story is on this, but I, I remember Ian talking about it. But how known? Who, I don't remember the name Palpatine being all that known until the prequels came around, at least for me, because I, you know, I'm sure um, the EU may have mentioned it or something, but I remember being like Palpatine and I remember buying the action figures and stuff. And I remember at the time I bought the action figures. It was 95 the power of the force. I think they said they started naming the action figure Emperor Palpatine. And I didn't know how to pronounce it. So I, I said Palpatine. I thought his name was Palpatine. I remember that. And then... The, n- the name Palpatine first appears in the prologue of Alan Dean Foster's 1976 novelization of the original Star Wars That's film. That's incredible. Yeah. Wow. So I thought it was pronounced Palpatine. And then the Phantom Menace comes out and they're saying Palpatine. I'm like, oh, wow. Okay. Um, so, but he probably didn't know. So when he saw the name Palpatine for the yeah. prequels, he probably. I thought- wish I would have. I wish I would have. You know, watched that or rewatched that or whatever. I remember him talking about it and George introducing it to him as actually wanting to play two characters, and he's like, "Oh, cool! I I'm just happy to play one. I get to play two. Cool." And like not really putting together that the two characters were actually the same person, or or maybe even just it was as simple as George called him and told him that and then when he got on set he's like well it's the same person you know and he's like i didn't even you know that didn't even dawn on me that it was the same person but yeah two characters that's interesting but um but it also is 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 uh fascinating that we have that like was it alan dean foster who created the name no that had to have been lucas but yeah, maybe it was like in a draft or something and he had access to those things. So he used it, but then, you know, it wasn't like anything official, but in Lucas's mind, that sort of was the name of the character. Yeah. Lucas came, I believe Lucas came up with the name. Um, I don't get too far in the weeds in case we're wrong about any of this stuff, but the, <laughs> yeah, the thing that I find the most interesting is the the suspension of disbelief that is created i mentioned before because you can really if you wanted to like if someone wanted to watch the movie starting with episode one and then you get you know through the the prequels and you see him get deformed and then you get him in empire strikes back now and then you get him in return of the jedi and then the sequels it just really does feel more together and like planned and it's just like it's so absurd how that happened. It is like, it, it's almost like when people say like, you have a better chance of getting hit by lightning. Like mm-hmm. it was just so perfect how that worked out. Like it, in, in what world is someone like, we're going to cast a, a, a guy in his mid thirties or late thirties to play a 90 year old decrepit old emperor when they, you know, they probably could have just gotten an older person like they originally did. Like, why? Why? Like, when Alan Webb couldn't do it, why didn't they just find another older actor? They've, they've already had a nice resume of established older actors that have worked with them. Peter Cushing, Alec Guinness, 
you know, I was just had, thinking that I was like, it's not like they w- were leaning towards younger cast for younger, hipper movies or anything like that. They definitely had older generation actors. Oh yeah. Or that, you know, older actors or, or established actors, you know, weren't drawn to that. Clearly that wasn't the case. Um, so it's interesting that they, that Lucas didn't say like, all right, we'll find me someone in the age. You know, we ever, we always see those, you know, those casting calls where it's like male 25 to 35, blah, blah, blah. Like, Zach Efron type. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Zach Efron pre HGH from Iron Claw, which by the way, that movie was awesome. I just want to say do, do you know, do you know why I chose Zach Efron? Cause he's 35. No, no, no. It was oh. because, because that was a, a, a real report is like, there were a lot of casting calls going out where they were reusing like lots of people were using Zach Afron type and uh-huh. he kept seeing it pop up and would be like, I'm right here. Like if I'm you Zac- like cast me, if yeah. you're looking for a Zach Afron type and I put in for this role, how am I not getting the role? <laughs> <laughs> I gotta see that. That's funny. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool. But I, yeah, so I'm surprised like George Lucas was like, you know, I need a, I need a male 75, you know, to whatever. And there, you know, Mary Selway probably thinking outside the box as a casting director. And, you know, she doesn't get enough credit. Like if you right. stood in front of a panel at Star Wars Celebration and said like, you know, Mary Selway, like it's, she's not going to get a, a, an ovation or anything like that. But she may have made the most important suggestion or decision in all of Star Wars casting. You can make the argument at least. Yeah, definitely up there. I mean, it's kind of one of those things where like, it's hard to see anybody else as Mark, you know, but Mark Hamill as Luke Skywalker. But if you kind of think about the reality of like, well, what if a movie did have somebody else in? Well, it either would have been successful or not, but this isn't, this isn't, um, this isn't a debate on whether he did a good job or somebody else could have done it. This is just the sheer fact that it was like casting a young person to play an old person, you know? And then how it just works out perfectly in that timeline. And Mm -hmm. it's just, it's so cool because like when I like, would, did I would, George wait to make his movies for that for reason? That, no, but probably uh, not. No. Cause I think, you know, the, 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 at least the narrative out there is that him seeing Jurassic park and what Spielberg did made him feel confident enough in the technology that he could make the prequels. Um, oh, I don't doubt that. But then he yeah. also goes like, what if I did? Well, I'd have to hire an emperor. Yeah. <laughs> You know, well, and then well, he's like, well, <laughs> you know, and it like right? almost contributes to the idea of maybe I should do it. That, that, that's an interesting thought is like, we'll never know. But like, did this casting help to push George into doing the prequels? Because it's too perfect. Almost like when people are like, we have to do a Kenobi series. He's right there. He's the perfect age and you got to do it and or else you'll miss it. It's like, I almost wonder if there's a part of George that was like, well, Ian would be, well, he, yeah, wow. He'd be right about the right age. If you look at the timeline. And I love George Lucas's commitment to making star Wars feel like it really happened. And because I'm looking at McDermott's filmography and I know he was cast off of doing plays. So it's not like they cast this guy off of doing knockout roles in movies. But once you're the emperor in a movie, you would think like, all right, let's see what other movies he's going to do after that. And he was only in three movies after Return of the Jedi. I only know of one of them. So there's Gorky Park, which I'm not familiar with, which came out the same year as Return of the Jedi. So I'm not even counting that. So it's it's the lesser known Jurassic Park prequel. (laughs) Yeah. So (laughs) So two movies since 1983 before the prequels he did dirty rotten scoundrels which i love with steve martin and michael kane he played arthur so he had a small role and then a movie called restoration in 1995 where he played a character named ambrose i don't know this movie restoration i'm not very familiar with it i don't think it was uh that big no it uh bombed at the box office so 
So George Lucas is like, I don't care. I'm bringing this guy back because it's going to make my story real. And also, McDormand is a good actor. And he did a great job of like dialing it back and playing a more human version of Palpatine in the prequels. But also at the same time, like you said, we get the Sidious part two, which mm-hmm. feels like the Emperor. So it just, I just love the fact that it just makes this all feel like a real connected timeline of stories like the emperor did he do being, movies after the prequels uh well he was in sleepy hollow in 99 mm-hmm. um which is the same year that phantom menace came out but he filmed sleepy hollow after uh the filming of phantom menace and then uh obviously he does the insert in empire strikes back in 2004 and then beyond yeah, not, that, not Star Wars, because obviously, we're at, we're at yeah, Skywalker we have the event. Lost City of Z in 2016 and the Odds uh, short film in 2009. So he does a lot it's of more. Wild. He yeah. does a lot more theater based stuff, some TV also, uh, small bits in TV. Um, but he's more of a theater based uh, talent. It's for sure. hard to try to make a career in something that you feel like you've already done the absolute best thing out there. Mm -hmm. Does that kind of make sense? Like, like, I don't know. I mean, obviously Harrison Ford did it, but like, if I were Mark Hamill, I'd be like, you know, like (laughs) you're, you're Luke Skywalker, man. I don't know. Like what other, I mean, the only thing you can do is sort of that career that Mark or uh, Harrison Ford did where he's like, he's this and that and this, you know Mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, That's the only thing. But like the chances that are happening, I mean, uh, Harrison Ford's like, you know, one in a billion. Yeah. Um, So I don't know. I just feel like if he's like, well, I'll try out this movie thing and he gets cast in the third Star Wars film and everybody's like, how (laughs) like what the heck you know and Mm -hmm. he's like yeah i did it it was crazy it was awesome and it's like i i I don't know that that you know i wasn't really into film but like that you know i did that one thing and that one thing was massive and then it's like okay well i'm done with it and then they come back and they're like we're gonna make more star wars movies like 20 something years later and they're like we have to have you back (laughs) you know and he's like okay I'll do three movies, you know, and they're like, yeah. banger, 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 you know, it's yeah. like and he huge was great. box office. Yeah, he was great in the prequels. And I wonder if that may have informed their decision to make that change in episode nine, because it's like, man, this guy, he starts off in Return of the Jedi. Then he get he does the prequels, all three of them as the Emperor. Then he we, they even get him to film something as they're filming Re- uh, Revenge of the Sith to insert over the Emperor, replacing the Emperor's part in Empire Strikes Back. So now he is the whole deal. He even did the voice in some of the animated shows, Rebels. Um, yeah, but we're gonna get Matt not, Smith not originally. Play. They did the same thing. Yeah. Oh, they replaced Sam Whitworth did the voices in Rebels, and then they later went in and. It, w- it wasn't until like the DVD mm. releases or the Disney plus releases or something like that, that they changed the voice of the emperor over to Ian. I mean, and you got to do it. You know, I think even I saw an interview with Sam Witt where it's like, like, I can't, how can I be offended by that? You know, he's exactly. guy. Yeah. But so then when it comes to rise of Skywalker, they're like, Oh, but we're going to get Matt Smith to pay, play a younger Palpatine, which is a very interesting, intriguing idea to think about. Um, Because I do think Matt Smith is a good actor and it could have been cool to be like, oh, look at this younger version of Palpatine because then they could have made a young Palpatine series and had him do that, all that stuff. But they were probably like, this guy has been in it for 40 years. We got to get him back. And that's probably what led to that decision. Now, I know people aren't thrilled with that, including our co-host having Palpatine return. I know, you know, Lacey's not a big fan of that, but... um, I, you know, Rise of Skywalker aside, it's still like I watched The Phantom Menace the other day, dude. I love that movie. I it, it is hands down my favorite of the prequels. It just it really is fun and it almost has its own nostalgia to it now. You know, we got the 25th anniversary. I'm probably going to go see it in the theaters. It might be the the 
I might take my son to his first movie and take him to the Phantom Menace. And I did feel nostalgia for the Phantom Menace, which was so strange to me because I remember two years before the Phantom Menace came out feeling nostalgic for A New Hope when I saw that re-released in theaters. And it's like now it's this, the, the prequel trilogy's turn and just watching Senator Palpatine planting the seeds of what we eventually see in Return of the Jedi, but it's something he filmed 15 years after that. It's just like, this is incredible that I'm this that this happened. It like still blows my mind. I I wish that he was more recognizable as the older emperor. In the Phantom Menace? No, in Return of the Jedi and somewhat in turn r- r- Rise of Skywalker, he's more recognizable for sure. But in the uh, Return of the Jedi, I feel like he's a little bit more masked up. In Return of the you, Jedi, I mean, you don't, you don't, you don't agree. I mean, obviously they they like put him in. I think he looks the makeup best in Return of the Jedi. No, no, no. I'm saying he doesn't look like Ian McDermott. You think? Oh yeah, yeah. But I'm that's what to... I'm saying. So you <laughs> wish he looked. I wish older? there was a way for him to look more like the rise of Skywalker in McDermott Emperor in Return of the Jedi, because that is actually how he would look older. But because he was so much younger and they were trying to make him look older, oh, I see things saying. to him that didn't, it was almost like, you know, those pictures you see online. That's like, this is what the friends cast will look like in, in 20 years. I see what you're saying, but also and they, they don't look actually like they do today. Yeah. I do see what you're saying, but also don't forget, even in rise of Skywalker, once he takes the power of the dyad, he has a makeup face on and he has, it's a way more uh, of the distorted, like, gross right which is which is weird because i think he looks more accurate to like normal ian mcdermott like before that happens when he's talking to kylo and he's all yeah that is him with like contacts in which yeah which and then like when he gets de-aged or like is better looking then they put makeup to make him look more like revenge of the sith or uh sorry yeah Return of the Jedi version. It's 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 odd choices, but like it's odd choices, but yeah. So like it's almost like the clone was unaffected by what happened to him because obviously it's a clone, so it wouldn't have what affected him in Revenge of the Sith with Mace Windu and the lightsaber and the Force melt like changing its face. So did the dyad? force powers also mess him up like it, it's very strange but he looked cool either way so um i i just you know having we talk about people in star wars playing these roles for so long and you know uh anthony daniels is currently the longest running because he just set the bar again by playing uh c-3po and ahsoka so now c-3po or uh, Anthony Daniels is at 47 years or 46 years playing C-3PO and, and he, he may not necessarily be done. Um, but the, 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 there's nothing to compare to the McDarmid thing. It's just so incredible how that worked out. George Lucas must've been like, I would love to have been in the room when George Lucas started writing, you know, his little yellow legal pad and he starts writing in his pencil with his gumball machine near him and he starts writing the script for The Phantom Menace and he's like, uh, Senator Palpatine, around 50 years old. And then he's probably like, wait a minute. I got the guy. We, he was like 35. Rick, get him on the phone. He was like 35 when we cast him. See if he's still around. See what he's doing. And they call him up. He's like, hey, do you want to come back? And he's like, yes. Lucas probably been like, I am a genius. <laughs> I, 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 I picture him less excited. I picture him being like, hmm. And then he like picks up the phone and he's like, how, how old Dean? You know, like he's talking to somebody and he's like, how old would, would he be right now? Right. Uh-huh. 
Yeah. Well, okay. All right. <laughs> he's like putting it together. He's oh, like, that worked out. In his head, he's like, yeah. that, that's working. Yeah. I don't picture him like excited. Like he just like Eureka. I feel like he'd be excited. I don't know. I don't know. But I, it, it's. I, I personally am, am leaning towards this whole thing. Like, I think he thought of this before he put pen to paper. And I think that like the just sheer like, oh, that would all work aspect of it might actually be something that led him to wanting to do it. You know, what would have been would have been crazier is if he had the idea for the prequels. And that's why he cast a younger version. It's not what happened because they cast an old man to play him originally. And the guy got sick. And then that sounds like something George would say, though. It's like, well, I always knew the story was going to be. Oh, he would. Yeah. Oh, you know, (laughs) my my old joke about the five George Lucases doing a Hollywood uh, reporter or whatever that Vanity Fair roundtable. Yeah. Yeah. And all of them disagreeing with each other. Because depending on the decade you get an interview with George Lucas, he either had three movies and that was it, six movies, nine, twelve. Like <laughs> George Lucas is in a room it would be like one of them would say, like, well, when I first thought of Star Wars, and then another one would interrupt and said, I thought of Star Wars. <laughs> yeah. It's and like, it was called The Star you guys Wars. Don't even realize you're the same person. The Adventures of Luke Star Killer with Mace Windy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like so it it would have been even crazier if in 1983 George is like, all right, we got to cast the emperor. He's like 88 years old. Um, go and find me a 35 year old actor. And they're like, what? Why? Why don't we just get an older actor? He's like, don't worry about it. You'll, you'll find out in about 15 years, but not the case, but that makes so, it even cooler because it worked out even without it being the plan. And that's what makes it the most amazing thing that exists in star Wars. And uh, I, I don't know that maybe they're like our listeners and, you know, maybe there's star Wars fans that don't see this. They're like, Oh, it worked out. It's not that big of a deal to me. It's just like so friggin' incredible. Like lightning so, in a bottle. I, it's just amazing. So I was just sitting here and I, I Googled cause I was looking at images of him when he was older and younger and stuff. And I happened to see a picture here of him next to Snoke. And I was thinking, well, Snoke was a CG character, you know, and like, we don't really know what he looked like when he was younger. You might be able to cast Andy Serkis as a younger Snoke at some point. You might Mm -hmm. be able to pull that off. And then it dawned on me, wait, this has happened before when Andy Serkis played Golem, an older Golem, he was yes. able to then, in a later movie, play the younger Golem, which actually just looked like him. Same movie, though, right? Nope. The next movie. Yeah, so, but they filmed them all at the same time. Okay, I mean, all right, maybe technically fair, and it's not its not as expansive over the course of like 20 years or like something, Like, this wasn't right? fate. It was a good decision. A good casting well, decision. I this think a, that that's cast- almost like the Ethan Hawke example, I think, because it was like, a no, 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 no. So, so I think they cast Andy Serkis to be Golem because of his expertise in this. But right. then when they decided to, and this is not in the books, when they decided to add a scene in the third movie of young Golem and how he got to where he was, they mm-hmm. were like, we need an actor to play that person. And then they're like, well, why don't we just use Andy? Like, why don't we just actually use the real person who yeah. is the player? Um, and not like another CG creature or uh, a, a child. We're like, why don't we just actually set this mm-hmm. in the place where he could be? So it's not it's not quite the same, but it is technically an actor playing an older character who's been make up to look older or whatever, CG. And then in a later movie, was cast to play the younger version of that character as himself at the age he is at currently. They made novelizations of the Lord of the Rings movie. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> well, they made a book out of that movie. <laughs> it's a great line from a great movie. John, whenever whenever another major franchise threatens Star Wars, you get so defensive of Star Wars. 
Oh no, that it's was like the- Star Wars has the best technology. And I was like, well, this movie also has really good technology. And you're like, yeah, but I mean, compared to Star Wars, well, I, I, like, I, I like Star Wars better. Yeah, you're always not, like, I didn't really say that in defense of Star, Star Wars. Wars. I was just what uh, doing a little joke, but um, yeah, I mean that that's all I got on this. I it's just I think it's. I, and I just don't know. Like maybe this is you know a topic everyone is fully aware of and how it all came to be. But like the, if you just again run down everything that happened, like they had an older actor in place ready to go. He falls ill. They send Mary out to look for a replacement, and she stumbles upon uh, this you know guy in his thirties doing a play in a very small theater. Mary Selway locks him in brings it to George and convinces him that he can do it because he was playing an older character in that play. And Lucas went for it. And it's just so crazy because when you think about uh, George Lucas and how he makes his decisions, like how he cast Peter Mayhew, like he, he walked into the room and Peter Mayhew stood up and George Lucas looked at him and said, like, you're hired. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't know that. Is that true? So Peter Mayhew said he was waiting in the room and he's like, George opened the door and I thought to stand up because uh, where I, my manners and where I grew up, you, when someone walks into a room, you stand up to greet them. And he's like, that wound up helping me because as I stood up, George looked his neck all the way up and was so impressed by how tall he was that he cast him. Uh, and I think that's an empire of dreams, but I love Peter Mayhew's voice. It's this just very like, I would love him to just like, tell me a fairy tale. Like he just had this cool voice, mm-hmm. speaking voice, but I think he was just very, just casual in how he made certain decisions. And she probably said like, no, this guy can do it. And he was probably so stressed out cause he's dealing with Richard Marquand and he's like, like the, the movie might be a bit of a mess. And he's like, all right, let's get this guy. Can you get, you know, he, then he talks to the makeup department. Can you make him look like this? And it, it, and all of that, that to have him going into it, and he knocks it out of the park. By the way, Return of the Jedi. Like if you watch that movie, you do not think that that's a thirty-seven-year-old man. You think that's an old man with some messed up makeup because the voice sounds so old too. Yeah. So he crushes that. But like we believe that we watch Return of the Jedi, we are seeing this old decrepit man, and somehow because of that decision, we are able to falsely go through a time machine and get him at 52 years old 15 years later to play a 30 years ago version of the character it's incredible it's one of the greatest things that ever like one of the most fateful things that ever happened to star wars Mm -hmm. to be one of the top casting decisions in franchise history because of that alone let alone how great he is but incredible um any final thoughts i mean no i i mean this this topic i feel like we've really discussed (laughs) expressed how crazy it is that it even happened i wish that you know we had even more time to study up on a lot of the things that went into um these decisions and these castings and, and looking at the, the, the stars and the authors and everything, the the writers of the movies and things like what were their, what have been their comments over the year of like how they felt about that or like, or here's a little quip that no one's ever said before on like celebration stage or something. You know, I, I wish I had a little bit more time to sort of dive into these details and these stories of what everybody thought about how this just happened to be so perfect. Yeah. Um, and again, it's like, it's not just perfect um, from even the aspect that we're talking about of like, oh, what are the odds that they would go back and film the prequel? But also just the fact that like, we've landed on an actor that is so good as this character that they have pushed that character into the higher echelon of the greatest film villains of all time. Yeah. Yeah. And then that's it. It's not like we go back and watch that. I, I was kind of talking about this earlier, but like, you know, sometimes when I go back and watch um, Star Wars, I see Harrison Ford. 
Yeah. You know, I see the actor Harrison Ford. I see Indiana Jones playing a space cowboy. Um, and that can be a little bit tricky sometimes, but with like Mark Hamill, for instance, I don't, although I see him more and more now as a celebrity, but when you have someone who's just really that, and that's what they're known for, and they really didn't do any other movies and people don't have a lot of connections, it just literally makes this guy, the emperor, that's it. That's who he is to everybody. And he has been able to play that character's in every which direction, timeline wise and real timeline, the star Wars timeline. And somehow he's able to make it work. And it makes sense with only the one real, <laughs> one real hang up, which is they cast him and aged him up in the beginning. That's the only weird thing about it. After that, he's been along the path the whole way. <laughs> you yeah, know, the that's correct true. Age, and, practically. And the fact that he was so good in return of the Jedi that they were able to sell us on Vader turning because he was more evil than the greatest cinematic villain of all time at the time. Right, right, yeah. Like, if he, if the Emperor doesn't work, the whole thing's a bust. And it really worked. So, just incredible. I Like, I am so thankful that that whole situation happened because it just, again, it makes it all feel that much more real in a galaxy far, far away. And isn't we'll it amazing that, so. sometimes that 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 major things, massive things aren't just ruined by like one thing? Like, how did everything come together on Star Wars? Because they could have done that movie and it could have been exactly the same in every single way, except for the Emperor could have talked like this. Yeah, right. Or, yeah, if it was, <laughs> and then we just see it in the theaters. We're like what <laughs> like this the, is so stupid and it's yeah. laughable the end and the whole thing gets ruined you know yeah if it was the emperor from the empire strikes back a, a woman sitting there and dubbed over with clive Ravel with monkey eyeballs and we're supposed to you know that it could have been a complete disaster <laughs> but they they figured it out so very it's 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 incredible and i'm just i love it I love the history of it. I love how everything worked out. So cool. So I hope I hope everyone enjoyed this discussion. Uh, if you didn't know about this fateful casting and how it came to be, hopefully you uh, you learned something and, and enjoyed our chat about it. If you have known about this, hopefully this brought back some memories and, and you know made you realize how how fateful this all really was and and how it's just made the saga even better. Um, so thank you all for listening, watching being a part of TRB. Uh, make sure you uh, follow Lacey uh, at Lacey Gillard on social media. She'll be back with us on Thursday for TRB Live. Um, and uh, for me, uh, at Johnny Hoey. And James, uh, you know, a little somber because of the passing of the creator, but uh, what's your yeah. handle? Uh, it's at Myra Trunks. And um, I did want to ask you this while we were still on the podcast. Mm -hmm. Just quickly. It doesn't have to be a crazy thing. But did you happen to catch um, Zack Snyder's interview on uh, or discussion on Joe Rogan? I didn't. No. I heard the, about the viewership thing. Is that what you're talking about? No. I, I mean, he said that or whatever. But actually, there were two things I, I thought were interesting for you is because of all of the deep dive into like the DC stuff and like how he sees these characters and things. That was all really interesting that I thought you might get a kick out of. And the other aspect of it was he talked more about like it, it, the, the other Rebel Moon quote is getting the headline. But mm -hmm. he did talk more about like why he had to do Rebel Moon not in the Star Wars universe. Oh, yeah? I got to check that yeah. out. Okay. It's probably like a three-hour interview, though. Do you know roughly where it is? Uh, I, I, No, I'd say it was like maybe an hour and a half. Oh, something bad. like that. It wasn't it crazy. Hmm. Hmm. Um, they talk a lot about 300 and just like, m you know, movie lore in general. But I, I did think that it was interesting that he talked about the Rebel Moon thing. Um, mm -hmm. And just, just re like really quickly, it wasn't even anything too deep in depth it was just along the lines of like the characters that he wanted to do were things that broke the tone of star wars and so he's like you can't do that in star wars because it gets too not like family friendly or whatever it's oh. like the the, the mm. things that it wasn't like that it had to be r-rated 
but it says like he wanted a person to walk into a room and and he wanted to say this is how you would feel in that situation mm-hmm. and you can't do yeah. that in star wars and so it's just and it was an interesting discussion but yeah let's check it out thought i'd throw it out there I mean, yeah, I mean, you got to give a plug to the most popular podcast in the world. He needs the viewers. You know? <laughs> yeah. If All you right. guys uh, don't know about this uh, indie <laughs> podcast, Joe Rogan, I hate that joke, but yeah, right exactly. I know you do. All right. Uh, and, and for, for us also, uh, make sure you're subscribed on all your uh, podcast apps. And of course, youtube.com slash at the resistance broadcast. So uh, thank you for that. Spread the word, tell your friends uh, throughout the land. Um, but uh, also our Patreon, patreon.com slash resistance broadcast. If you yeah. are able to support the show, five bucks a month gets you in the base. That gets you access to all of our exclusive mini episodes and all of our exclusive content on the Patreon page. And as you climb the tiers, uh, we have a $10 tier, which gets you into our Discord server. Great community, amazing people. Uh, I can't say enough, uh, but check it out. Patreon.com slash resistance broadcast if you can support us we appreciate it very very much there's a lot of you who listen to us and if even half of you were had a chance and were able to support us on patreon uh we could do a lot of big things here so uh, mm-hmm. if you can please consider it uh we appreciate it um a big shout out to the generals and spice runners of course carmelo john reese jetta rosewater frank grande nick kratz chris morales brian smith matt chitty danny mike ramori brendan mclaughlin sneaky zebra colin cormier Dave Hornack and Jolton Jedi DiMaggio and the Spice Runners, David Probus, Neil Shaw, Kendall Gellner, Andrew Staley, Jeremy Myers, and the Fort Worthy and, and all of our listeners, supporters, however you support TRB, whether it's just listening or on Patreon. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll be back on Thursday night with TRB Live to talk news, rumors, your questions, all that fun stuff we always have. So make sure you, you check in with us then. But until then, have a great week. Enjoy the extended sunlight. And we'll see you next time right here on the Resistance Broadcast. See you around, kids.